You ready? Ooh, guess we're ready. I was watching the great big huge clock on the top of the glass up there. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I am Mandy Walls. I am currently running uh, professional services, customer success, and community for uh, Chef Software. Uh, we're based, our EMEA office is based in London, so I'm currently commuting and collecting air miles. I've been with Chef in the professional services side uh, since November 2011, so I've seen a lot of um, customer projects, a lot of DevOps transformations, if you will, so that's why I put together this talk about DevOps culture and um, some of the things that we've seen over the course of the past couple of years. Um, I'm happy to talk about Chef as much as you want to later. I'm not really going to talk too much about Chef in this talk. Um, I will tweet out these slides later if you're interested. Um, I'm LNXCHK on pretty much every system on the internet. Never any competition for my handle for some reason. Uh, so why DevOps culture? Um, it's sort of the fuzzier, more challenging bits and pieces of putting it together a modern IT transformation. Uh, lots of folks will know their initial compunction is to go out, buy some tools, get some stuff, do some bits. And the harder part of that is making sure that your teams are actually working to the most optimal uh, configuration. They're supporting each other, and things are flowing well. That's, for a lot of organizations, a bigger challenge than actually installing some tools, buying some packages, and even hiring professional services in to, to come and help them do that. Uh, culture is very important to the organization. It impacts how they react to stimuli and, re and how they react to um, economic pressure, market pressure, things that are going on in their space, whatever their industry happens to be. So there's a lot of baggage that comes along with how, what, how culture uh, is, motivates people, how, how things get put together. So we want to take a look at, as we're helping folks move towards a more modern IT structure, we're looking at how they're uh, reacting to market opportunity, are they able to embrace change? Uh, I work for a vendor, so the first indication, of course, is that they've called us in the first place, right? Uh, and then we take a look at what they're actually after, what they really want to be doing. Uh, did they just read an article in a magazine and think it might be a good idea? Are they actually committed to making the changes that might be required? Uh, we also take a look at how the organization works with problems, right? When things don't go right, what happens? Is there positive outcome from learning? Is there a negative impact to individuals? How the organization reacts to positive and negative stimulus? And finally, how does an organization treat individuals at whatever level, whether they're individual contributors, mid-level managers, executive staff, whatever the case might be, how those folks are treated, how their voices are heard, the uh, empowerment that they have, all influences uh, how well we're able to actually help them. So culture is one of those fuzzy things. Like It's one of those you sort of know it when you see it or know it when you're in it kind of idea. Um, and if you change jobs, you think, oh, the culture here is really different. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. But it, to take a look at some of the primary indicators, you're looking at how people are rewarded, what they're rewarded for, the kinds of behaviors that are supported, uh, who gets the resources, like when there are budget constraints, who's the first project to be impacted, who's the last project that's sort of maybe uh, golden cow, whatever sort of project that never gets sacrificed. How are people, uh, what happens when things go wrong? Are people punished? Are there punitive measures? Uh, for uh, decisions that don't go well, for experimentation, um, and finally, like the actions and symbolic structures of the leaders, what they actually do, what they value, what they say in an all-hands meeting, and those sorts of things all impact how people are then able to behave. So one of the things in the past four or five years that um, if you 
go to any DevOps sort of events, right? So there's DevOps days and there's all kinds of other meetups and stuff like that. If you follow any of the folks uh, on DevOps.com or uh, on Twitter or whatever, there's uh, a lot of things that we've been starting to pull in from other industries, right? There's a lot of uh, external to our to the IT industry research that's been done on organizational behavior, organizational change, human factors, safety, uh, impacts of things like um, Toyota Kata, lots of places where we've been starting to draw a lot of experience and information, right? Applying things learned in manufacturing and healthcare and aviation or even uh, nuclear systems into uh, IT infrastructure, right? It's a different kind of mission critical, right? But it's still complex systems. So uh, one of the papers that's kind of interesting and gives a rather simplified framework for looking at how culture evolves and sort of uh, containerizing uh, different types of culture is a paper called The Typ Typology of Organizational Cultures by a sociology professor from, I think, Michigan State is where he was at the time. It was actually published in the British Medical Journal's uh, Quality and Safety in Healthcare. So um, he was actually researching how teams of doctors, nurses, estheticians, um, or anesthesiologists, estheticians like do your eyebrows, uh, react in emergencies, in emergency rooms and things like that. Um, and how information flow from healthcare providers impacts patient outcomes, right? So life-changing events for a lot of people and how the information gathered at one end of the process does or does not reach the other end of the process. So super important things. Um, so borrowing from that sort of information flow kind of idea, there are some interesting learnings that you can apply to other organizations that aren't necessarily life-changing, right? So um, one of the things that, that he posits is that you know, information drives alignment to goals, uh, awareness of the organization, of situations, and how individuals in that team or that organization are empowered to make decisions, right? So you think about how information comes from a test or a CT scan or something in healthcare, and then how it gets to the doctor that's able to interpret it, how that's actually able to be made into a patient therapy, those kinds of things from flow from one end to the other. And there's also cases where um, one, one of the cases he cites was a study by radiologists who were taking x-rays of kids for things and finding early indicators of child abuse, things like that, and not necessarily able or maybe willing to report it, right? So life-changing impacts with the flow of information. Westrom has categorized three primary types of organizations. And um, it, based on how and where information is able to flow within the organization. And I see a lot of these same characteristics reflected in IT organizations as they're trying to you know, boot up a, a DevOps transition or modernization project. Uh, the first one's pathological, the second one's bureaucratic, a third one is generative. If we take a look at some of the characteristics of these types of organizations, <clears throat> the pathological organization is power-oriented. There's not a lot of cooperation. Um, responsibilities are either shirked or pushed off or delayed. Uh, bridging is actively discouraged. Failure results in scapegoating. And there's not a lot of novelty and innovation sort of embrace and, and, and um, and put forward. As you read down through the list, like I start to think about teams that I've worked with in the past. So like I'm not, I remember one particular storage operations team that was highly pathological. No one actually wanted to work with them. Not the best sort of team to work with. The middle one, bureaucratic, rule oriented, right? Have a lot of frameworks, a lot of appropriate channels. Information flows through the exact same way every time. There may be some local cooperation, narrowed responsibilities, people very choosy about what they're actually going to do. Um, and failure may result in the idea that justice must be done, right? You were bad, so we're going to punish you in some way. 
The final one, generative, these are performance-oriented organizations, and they have high cooperation, they share risks, lots of bridging of organizations is encouraged. People share information, not only with their own teammates, not only with their own department, but as wide in the organization as they can. Failure leads to inquiry, and novelty ends up being implemented or experimented with at the very least. So if you follow sort of how DevOps has evolved, some of the things out of the generative uh, category have definitely emerged as repeated themes, right? So uh, failure, to failure leads to inquiry is really the genesis of the, uh, the idea of a blameless postmortem or postmortem practice, where if there's a problem, so a failure of whatever your services that you're providing, internal, external, customer facing, uh, employee facing, you sit down, you talk about it, you figure out how the system failed the users, right? What happened? How can we fix it? How do we move forward in a better place? Bridging. Uh, one of my colleagues, Michael Ducey, actually has a set of talks that he calls the goats in the silos. And it's exactly about this, right? About the ability of some individuals to go beyond their current teams and talk to other people and work with other teams and on other tasks. Um, it's one of the things that is um, super important when you have like a large organization with narrowly focused responsibilities and teams. Novelty gets implemented. Lots of teams are, are good at, at this. Uh, Etsy, in particular, has done a number of uh, talks and things about how they uh, implement A-B testing, how they experiment on their site, how they uh, take a look at how things affect the users that come to their site, whether it is a, a marketing plan or they are experimenting with login flow or they've changed the way the page loads images, things like that. They're very uh, intense in their experimentation uh, and do it on a regular basis. So all characteristics of these sort of generative, uh, fast-moving, forward-moving uh, organizations. One thing to note, though, there's not necessarily anything that is indicated explicitly by the size or the age of the organization. Especially in large corporate organizations, there may be individual teams that exhibit uh, any variety of these three categories of, of characteristics. Uh, it's even not necessarily indicated by industry. Some of the examples that the author cites in the paper uh, are related to aviation, military deployments, um, healthcare, NASA is cited in a couple of different ways for a number of different issues. Uh, specific internal behaviors, too. If you're working with an international organization, some may be more expected than others, and that also causes interesting characteristics inter internally. So let's talk a little bit about pathological organizations and, and how you can sort of um, work within the, the existing framework of a pathological organization. And um, if you're looking towards moving forward in your IT path, doing some DevOps maybe, figuring that stuff out. So our pathological organization is going to be power oriented, right? It's maybe based on a hero culture. There may be pockets of places where there's one expert and what that person says goes. You know, Bob and Alice built the, built the SDN stuff. Like that's the only, thing, the only people who can make any decisions about those sorts of things. These organizations are obsessed with personal power, uh, influence, we call glory, right? So the person who's in charge is in charge, and you have to ask their permission to do anything. There's also a lot of hoarding of information and access. Uh, and you'll see this in places where even the wiki is like explicitly password protected, and there's a firewall in front of it, even internally, and it's very hard to get access to information. Getting this to DevOps, right? So it's not that these teams aren't trying, right? They've heard the, the jargon. They've read a couple of articles. They're ready to talk some DevOps. Um, but some of the problems that you end up having is there's already a culture of low cooperation between teams, right? There's a lot of pressure between teams to have success ab above one another rather than together, right? There's not a lot of shared uh, work. Um, we see this implemented as gatekeepers, right? The people who buy the tool, because it's a high-risk sort of organization, the person who buys the tool locks it down, whatever it happens to be, monitoring and metrics, configuration management, other information sharing. 
everything has to go through that particular person. The other ones are empire builders, and the, these people are very fun, right? They're trying to eat up as much uh, budget, resources, allocation, people, whatever they can get their hands on and say, well, this project's really important, I need more resources, and it's about their personal power struggle internally. When you're working in these sorts of organizations, it's hard to feel what we call safe, right? The safety being the ability to say, hey, I don't think this is right. Hey, maybe this project is not ready to go live. Hey, there's still some bugs that we need to fix. I think this is not going to be good, right? Even stepping up and saying, we're not ready to do this, may end up in punitive measures, right? So low, low safety. Uh, you don't get to really talk about failure, right? People may get fired. It's one of the sort of um, genesis of the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper says, well, this is my budget. I paid for it out of my resources, so I have to protect it from all of you guys because I might get fired if it doesn't work, right? So there's a, an, an instigation of that behavior because of the punitive nature of the rest of the organization. Coping in these teams can be super frustrating, right? You feel like you can't get anything done, that the project you're working on is not being taken seriously, uh, things like that. Um, he cites examples of pathological organizations where it's incredibly dangerous, right? Healthcare. If you can't say to the doctor, hey, you know, this test indicates X, Y, and Z, the patient's life may be at danger, right? Um, military, aviation, uh, it was one of the, the indications out of, I think, the Challenger and Columbia disasters, both, actually, of things that were underreported, uh, engineers that were afraid to, to stand up and say, you know, I don't think this system is safe. Uh, in IT, a lot less life-threatening, right, most of the time for our internal email and things like that. But um, you tend to be slower to improve and a lot slower to react to market dynamics, right? So someone may be sitting on your uh, mobile projects, right, and gatekeeping all of those sorts of things, keeping the organization from moving forward. Individuals who disagree are, uh, can be in a very perilous position, depending on how much they make noise, right? Uh, they may be the squeaky wheel, they may be invited to new opportunities, right? Um, and some of them may feel that they have to leave anyway. And that's, that's fine, too. There's a lot of work to be done other places. Uh, breaking this pattern often happens in a change of leadership, right? So, um, unfortunately, sometimes we go into an organization and we'll say, all right, we'll, we'll help you do X, Y, and Z. And um, it's super disappointing when the customer that we work with isn't quite doing all the things that they need to do. Uh, and sometimes that fails and they go away. Sometimes they have a change in leadership. Someone else takes an interest in the, in the initiative. And that, that personality change, that little cultural shift, is enough to sort of kick things forward. So it, there is often a light at the end of the tunnel. Stepping back a little bit from a lot of command and control into rules-based organizations, bureaucratic organizations are uh, reliant on uh, rules and channels and all those sorts of things. So you end up with a very narrow responsibilities and uh, that sort of contained organization. So these folks are obsessed with their positions, their turf, their department. My department doesn't do that. You have to talk to somebody else. Or we only do that on Tuesdays. Put a ticket in. It'll go through the change review board. We'll talk about it. If it's approved, then maybe we'll schedule it for you. We'll talk about it in six weeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're smiling. It's familiar, right? Responsibilities are meticulously laid out by department. Right? Like, uh, these are the only four people who can make a change to the firewall. They're the only ones who can ever touch it or have any input on it. These are the people who make the changes to the network. These are the people who allocate new email storage. Uh, pocket by pocket by pocket. Everybody is very uh, narrowly aligned. Do you DevOps in this kind of organization? We often see these kinds of folks spawn up a DevOps team, right? Because 
They, they're going to do this new thing. It's really a tools team, right? They're going to do some automation. They're going to put some metrics together. They're going to do some other uh, tools and glue and things like that. They call it a DevOps team. Does in a bureaucratic organization, every new initiative has to have its place in the hierarchy, right? We have to know where they fit. I have to know if my stuff's more important than your stuff, and you're new, so we have to slot it together, right? Um, in these cases, something like DevOps isn't everyone's job. This is a place where nobody's going to say quality is job one, right? Because quality gets tacked onto the end by the QA team, and you hope it all works out in the end. Um, for bureaucratic organizations, small pilot projects, right, that are sort of narrow in focus and um, very driven toward a very specific goal, right? We need to get XYZ uh, moved out of this data center by November, right? Finite project, end goal, let's spin up some new tools, see if we can do it super effectively. Those kinds of projects with a DevOps mindset and the tool chain in them uh, often give a, uh, bring a lot of success in a bureaucratic sort of system because it's sort of contained, it's maybe in, it's like it being in a zoo, right? It's sort of uh, self-sufficient. Bureaucratic organizations, as far as safety goes, your ability to say, I think this is wrong, usually locally safe because there's a lot of idea of loyalty to your team, right? So your teammates are going to uh, bolster you up and say, we agree with you. Um, failure usually requires, uh, requires justice, so there's still not a lot of wide risk-taking or experimentation. What you might see is like there's an entire department totally dedicated to like weird experiments, right? Like there's a center for innovation, right? Because not everybody is allowed to innovate. Only this little team is allowed to innovate. We have to keep them contained so it doesn't escape, right? Coping in bureaucratic teams, it's usually just easier if you follow all the rules, even when they contradict each other, right? Well, I'm supposed to put this ticket in for this thing, but I won't know what to put into it until I get this ticket back from this thing, but they're circularly dependent. Um, you pick your battles, right? So uh, some of the first generation of, um, the team I was on during the first generation of virtualization, right? So we were moving from bare metal to first gen, uh, provisioned cloud sort of things, right? You pick your battles. We wanted to say, well, we want to be able to provision anything we want to by request. And the data center team's like, no, you have to go through the framework. So you meet in the middle, and you say, well, how about if we limit our choices to these five things, and we can get those things as often as we want to, and anything else that's special will go through your framework, right? So you allow both teams to sort of get a little bit of what they want by uh, compromising and picking battles as appropriate. That helps you uh, build trust, right? Because a lot of the things that cause people to partition themselves off are because they've been gotten burned or been let down by uh, external resources. The other thing with bureaucratic teams is you have to be very, very patient, right? Time horizons in years, not necessarily weeks or months, right? To, uh, sort of modernize the processes in, in places where people are very rules-based. Uh, we get a lot of uh, skunkworks projects out of these kinds of teams, right? There's like a bunch of people that have gone rogue in a basement somewhere, and these are probably the same people that brought Linux in like 10 years ago, and nobody knew until it was running everything, right? Um, sometimes they break out, sometimes they die off, Right? Depends on, on just how successful they end up being. Um, successful projects often get attention, attract a following. You want to make sure they don't get to pathological tendencies, right? Where you say, oh, well, you know, these guys know what they're doing, so we'll worship at their feet for these particular initiatives. Finally, generative organizations. Uh, these are the folks that are moving forward, doing their innovation, being uh, internally reflective. Right? So we have lots of inquiry, we have lots of communication, lots of sharing. These folks are performance oriented. And 
if you're a sort of a cynic, you'll say, you know, these folks, they've all drunk the Kool-Aid, right? They're, they're all in. We, we're not even sure they made a logical decision, but they're good to go. But really, internally, everybody has said, this is our mission. As an organization, we are flying jet airplanes. We are making mobile apps for banks. We are saving lives. We are putting tea cozies on the internet, whatever it is that we're doing. We're going to do it really, really well, and we're going to be really awesome at it. There is a free flow of information. Things are posted internally. They may be talked about a lot externally, too. You see a lot of these teams doing blog posts from their engineering teams, because it's a hiring practice, right? Um, they are at events like this. They're sharing what they're doing. Uh, internally, there's lots of shared risks and responsibilities. We're going to build this project. Here's what it looks like. Let's talk about this topology. How's it going to affect everybody's teams? How's it affect the things you're responsible for? There's a lot of high trust and individual empowerment. So individuals have enough information, they have enough awareness to say, I know how to make a good decision about the things that the mission needs, right? I can make a good decision for this patient, I can make a good decision for this service, whatever it happens to be. These are sort of your initial DevOps organizations, right? Uh, it ends up being just the way they do things. There is a lot of sharing. There is a lot of uh, people working together, uh, working towards their common goals. Uh, back in 2010, John Willis originally put out the, the CAMS idea for DevOps, where it was culture automation, metrics, and sharing. For a, a team like this, everybody takes part in the automation, metrics, and sharing. That all indicates back into how the culture flows gets all of the, the sort of DevOps stuff going. Any new projects end up inheriting your DevOps DNA right from the start. You know you're going to share how things are going. Your metrics are going to be published. There may be a dashboard on a big screen in the dining room, right, that everybody gets to see how your stuff is doing. Sharing is common. Things are celebrated. Whether it's good, bad, we learned some stuff. It was awesome. Everybody ate donuts, and it was great. These organizations are usually considered to be globally safe. Anybody can say at any time, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with this. This doesn't look like it maybe is ready for production. You end up with blameless postmortems. There's a lot of work being done in this space, a lot of seminars, a lot of things being published about how to work in a blameless space, recognizing that the systems that you run may be made up of technology and human beings together are really complex, and most of them are more than a human being can hold in their head, right? There's a lot of learning and human factors from this space, from uh, nuclear reactors and uh, aviation. These teams are also open to a lot of experimentation, right? Change a line, tweak this, see how this changes, affect the, or the uh, process that we're doing. Getting to this place, right, from the other two, right, things that are hard to do, right, things that uh, people have to be kind of open about themselves, right, um, you want to build trust. And that's, that's a hard thing to do if you're in an, in an organization that has some injury, right. Some of the things that lead organizations to being pathological, especially in the first place, are a lot of organizational PTSD, right. People know that if they work with John over there, he's going to be a jerk and it's going to be really painful. Uh, communication. Posting things internally, posting things externally, sharing stuff, having everybody have access to make edits on all the documentation, on the wiki, on whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and also sharing knowledge. So communication at one level, right? Talking to people and, and doing stuff, but also putting out real information, because it's totally possible in pathological and bureaucratic information or in organizations that the information coming out of a team is really just PR, right? And it's got a spin on it, and they've hidden a little bit of the details, things like that. Um, but you want to be totally open with as much of the information as you legally can be, right? If you have other requirements, like um, SOCs or HIPAA or anything like that, you take all those into account. We embrace and build from failure, right? We learned that we didn't have the right monitors on the database system, and it crashed, and the site was down for a while. Or we learned that the network was saturated in front of the email server, so we had to fix that, put a new card in the router or whatever. 
We also are clear on goals, and we help empower people. This often comes from leadership, right? So p leaders being very conscious that it's uh, really important to say, here are our goals, right, without having some mushy things every quarter. You can do it, right? Any organization can work towards becoming more generative, right? Uh, expanding communication, expanding trust. It doesn't matter on uh, industry, size of the organization, age of the organization. One of the most interesting examples cited in the paper uh, is about a, an actual battleship in the US Navy, how they changed the command and control structure to have more pow empowerment around, among the sailors. It was super interesting to, to think about something as rigid, really, as the military sort of embracing input from people at, the, at all levels. It requires leadership support, right? This is one of the things that, unfortunately, people are most disappointed about when I tell them, yeah, well, it's gonna be tough unless we get your leaders on board, right? So there's, uh, there's work there in a lot of organizations. You set the values, you remember set the rewards, the punishments, all those sorts of things so you can keep people aligned, make sure they're on, on, uh, on mission with the goals, know what they're supposed to do, and are happy to do it. So there's the, again, the, the name of the paper, Typology of Organizational Cultures. It's not a super long read, but there's a lot of really good stuff in the uh, references as well. Um, some interesting things there. So that was my half an hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>